Hey guys, um, Mrs. Winter and I talked about continuing our Stargirl read-along uh, online. So I'm going to read chapter 28. I think that's where we ended. It's possible that I read part of it or all of it, but um, at least that way we will remember where we were. But Stargirl is about to enter that competition, the speaking competition. And that's where we left off. So hopefully you guys can give it a thumbs up once you've read it. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. All right. Her parents met us in the lobby of the hotel where Susan, Mr. McShane, and I each had a room for the night. After we checked in, the five of us ate a buffet lunch in the hotel restaurant. Then we watched Susan board a bus that would take her and 18 other contestants to Phoenix West High School. There were 38 contestants. 19 had already given their speeches that morning. By the end of the afternoon, 10 finalists would be chosen. The finals would take place that evening. To be honest, none of us was surprised that Susan made the cut. She was incredibly good. The surprise was this. Her speech was new. It was not the one she had given at Micah High. It was not the one she had been practicing for weeks in front of me and Peter Sinkovitz and assorted Sawaros. It was not the one I had heard just the day before, but it was wonderful. There were some elements of the old speech in it and much that was as new as the morning, like a butterfly. Her words fluttered from image to image she swung from the distant past, Barney, Archie's Palocene rodent skull, to the present, Cinnamon, to the distant future, the death of the sun. From the most ordinary here, the old man, nodding off on the bench at Tudor Village, to the most extraordinary there, a newly discovered galaxy, 90% to the end of the universe. She touched on silver lunch trucks, and designer labels and enchanted places. And when she said her best friend gave her pet rat a ride on his shoulder, tears came to my eyes. It was a jumble. It was a mishmash. And somehow she pulled it all together. Somehow she threaded every different thing through the voice of a solitary mockingbird singing in the desert. She called her speech, I might have heard a moa. The auditorium was half full, mostly with small groups of students and parents from the competing schools. After a contestant finished, his or her supporters whistled and whooped as if doing so would influence the judges. The rest was polite applause. When Susan finished, the four of us managed a modest cheer, but that was about it. No whistles, no whoops. I think we were made of more timid stuff than the speechmaker herself. Back at the hotel, Mr. McShane and I mobbed her, if two can be a mob. Her parents were more reserved. They were full of smiles and well dones, but they seemed no more surprised at her success than Susan did. When the adults went off to the gift shop, I had her to myself. I said, where did that come from? She grinned. Did you like it? Sure, but it's not what I've been hearing for the last month. What were you doing? Practicing a secret speech on the side? The grin got wider. Nope, that was the first time I heard it too. I stared at her slowly. Her, oops, I stared at her. Slowly her words sank in. Let me get this straight. You're saying you just made it up this morning? I'm saying I didn't even make it up. It was just there. All I did was open my mouth and let it go. She held both hands out to me and snapped her fingers. Presto. I gaped at her. What are you going to say tonight? She threw out her arms. Who knows? The five of us ate, at, ate an early dinner in the hotel restaurant. Afterward, we waited in the lobby while Susan changed clothes. She stepped off the elevator wearing a peach-colored pantsuit 
She slinked across the lobby, modeling for us. She sat on her mother's lap and said, my personal seamstress made it for me. We applauded lightly and sent her off the bus, sent her off on the bus. The general public was invited to the evening show and the auditorium was packed. People stood in back, down front. A high school orchestra played rousing music by John Philip Sousa. The 10 contestants sat on stage. Seven were boys. All of the contestants appeared to be grim and nervous, stiff as mannequins, except for Susan, who was bending the ear of the boy sitting next to her. He nodded occasionally, but kept his eyes and spine at attention and obviously wished that she would shut up. Susan's parents chuckled knowingly at her behavior, while I tried to disguise a stab of jealousy. One by one, the contestants took the long walk to center stage to give their speeches. The applause was equally hearty for all. A grade school girl in a frilly white dress handed each contestant a bouquet of roses, yellow for the girls, red for the boys. While the girls cradled their roses, the boys looked at them as if they were hand grenades. Susan was next to last to speak. When her name was called, she bounced up from her chair and practically ran to the microphone. She did a sprightly pirouette, a curtsy, waved her hand in a window washer motion and said, hi. Accustomed to seeing stiff, mortified contestants, the audience responded with uncertain titters. They didn't know what to make of this unconventional teenager any more than we had on the first day of school. Several bold souls said hi and waved back. She did not begin, at least not in the usual sense. There was no ringing preamble. She merely stood there comfortably chatting away as if we were all on rocking chairs on her front porch. Murmur drifted toward the ceiling. People were waiting for her to get started. The murmur subsided as it occurred to them that this was it and they were missing it. The quiet that then fell over the auditorium was absolute. I was more tuned into the audience than to the speaker. And if for the last five minutes of her talk, anyone was breathing, I could not detect it. When she finished with barely a whisper, can you hear it? And, and leaned with her cupped hand to her ear, 1,500 people seemed to inch forward, straining to hear. There were 10 seconds of purest stillness. Then she turned abruptly and went back to her chair. Still, there was no reaction. What's going on? I wondered. She sat forward in her chair her hands folded primly on her lap. And then it came suddenly, explosively, as if everyone had awakened at once. We were all on our feet, clapping and shouting and whistling. I found myself sobbing. The cheering was as wild as that of the crowd at the championship basketball game. Should I stop or should I go on? I feel as though I should continue. I said I was only going to read one chapter, but this next one isn't very long. So I think I'm going to keep reading. Are you surprised? Probably not. Chapter 29. She won as she said, <laughs> as she said she would. The silver plate they gave her twinkled like a starburst in a galaxy of flashing cameras. Two TV crews watched her in lights and interviewed her backstage. Strangers mobbed her, citizens of Phoenix gushing, telling her they had been coming to the contest for years and had never heard anything like it. School children thrust programs in her face for autographs. Every parent wanted her for a daughter, every teacher for a student. She was so happy. She was so proud. She yelped and cried when she saw us. She hugged each of us in turn, and I thought she would squeeze the breath out of me. 
Back at the hotel, everyone already seemed to know. The doorman, the desk manager, the people in the lobby and the elevator. Suddenly, she had this magical, wonderful power. Whoever laid eyes on her smiled, and the English language dwindled to a single word, repeated over and over, congratulations. We walked, we floated around the block to burn off our excess energy. Back at the hotel, we were invited into the nightclub, even though Susan and I were underage. We drank ginger ales and ordered jalapeno poppers, and we all danced to a country and western band while Susan's face beamed on the late news from the TV above the bar. The dance floor was the only place where she did not carry her silver plate. First thing next morning, there she was, sliding under the door of my hotel room, her picture on the front page of the Arizona Republic. I sat on the edge of the bed and stared at it, pride welling in me. I read the story. It called her speech mesmerizing, hypnotic, mysteriously touching. I pictured folded morning papers tossed from cars, landing in driveways all over Micah. We all met for breakfast buffet. People stared and nodded and smiled and silently lipped said, congratulations across the restaurant. We headed for home in a two-car caravan. For a while, Susan was her usual chatty self. She put the silver plate on the front seat beside Mr. McShane. She told him it would ride next to him for, the, for 10 whole minutes, but he could touch it if he wanted. This was his reward, she said, for telling her about Moa's as soon as the 10 minutes was up, she took back the plate. And we, as we drew nearer the town, the chatter subsided and finally stopped. We rode the last 10 miles in silence. She took my hand. The nearer we came, the harder she squeezed. When we hit our outskir the outskirts of town, she turned to me and said, Do I look okay? I told her she looked great. She didn't seem to believe me. She held up the silver plate and studied her reflection. She turned to me again and looked at me for some time before she spoke. I've been thinking, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to hold on to the plate myself, okay? I nodded. Until, until they lift me onto their shoulders, then I'll give it to you, understand? I nodded. So stay next to me every second. Crowds can separate you, you know. They do that, okay? I nodded, okay. Her hand was hot and sweating. We drove past a man in his driveway. He was dipping a large broom-like brush into a pail and painting the asphalt with black sealer. He was bent intently to work to his work in the noonday sun and somehow I knew at that moment what would happen. I could see it. I wanted to shout to Mr. McShane, no, don't turn, don't go there. But he did turn. He turned and there was the school in front of us. And never in my life have I seen a place so empty. No banners, no people, no cars. Probably around back. Mr. McShane said, his voice was hoarse, parking lot. We swung around back to the parking lot and yes, there was a car and another car and people, three of them, shading their eyes in the sun watching us. Two of them were teachers. The other was a student, Dory Dilson. She stood apart from the teachers alone in the black shimmering sea of asphalt. As we approached, she held up a sign a huge cardboard sign bigger than a basketball blackboard backboard. She set the sign on edge and propped it up, erasing herself. The red painted letters said, way to go, Susan. We're proud of you. The car stopped in front of it. All that was left to see of Dory Dilson were two sets of fingers holding the sides of the sign. We were close enough now to see the sign was trembling. And I knew that behind it, Dory was crying. There was no confetti, no kazoos. 
Nothing cheered, not even a mockingbird. Wow. How sad. Are we surprised? Probably not. Well, we miss you guys. Um, we miss you a lot. And we will definitely let you know as we find out any information. But we want you to know that we care about you. And we hope this, um, despite the, the sadness of these chapters, we hope that um, this brings some um, cheer to your extended break. Um, give give um, give this a thumbs up down below, and uh, we'll try to add some more chapters. Um, feel free to make comments and encourage each other.